is a quick introduction to digital illustration, specifically looking at line art styles. So keeping it nice and simple, just a really quick sort of touch base on different things you can do in Illustrator to do sort of line style illustration. Now, if you've not done digital illustration before, um, you might know normal illustration. Now, sort of traditional illustration might be uh, by hand, so using different handmade techniques. The key thing with illustration is that it's not fine art. So it's very different to traditional painting or drawing that a fine artist would do. The key thing with an illustration is that it's more stylized. It's more sort of individual to the designer. It's more, um, maybe more abstract or more simplified or more conceptual, or it's less about achieving something that's realistic. Now you can see there's lots of different styles um, of doing digital illustration, there's definitely not one way to do it. You've got very sort of like geometric style things, more abstract, more sort of like artistic with texture. Um, you also get very sort of realistic with sort of like tone and shading or sort of in proportion. So you can get some really detailed work. Um, it's really up to you how you do it. You'll sort of see some designers don't use any tone or shading, so they do very flat work like this one where it's a few colours and it's very flat, or it's very simplistic and it's just line, or it's just shapes and simple colour. You'll see some designers are more about layering and about adding texture, and like this one that has that sort of like watercolour feel to it, or a collage feel to it. Some designers just work in black and white, and they almost recreate like a, a pen drawing, but digitally, so it's all about line. Um, some designers don't use line at all, so like this one, which is very flat, but it's also got this sort of 3D tone and shading, but there's very little line art on there. Same with that one. Um, and one thing you'll notice with illustration as well, it can be quite simplified. So it doesn't have to look realistic. So it can be about minimal. It can be about simplifying shapes. It can be quite surreal, quite abstract. Um, it could be quite geometric. If you look at these two examples here, we've got a shoe, um, which most likely has been done from a photograph. So it looks like a shoe. It's the right shape and size and angle. We've got this um, half tone pattern which is used for shading, we've got these bright colours, we've got these really chunky lines on the outside, we've got a thinner line on the inside and if I actually open this one up you can see we've got these sort of white lines here which indicate a highlight and then we've got this little use of line in the corners here to indicate 3D. So we've got something that's got some very realistic techniques going on but it's also very stylized. they've used that pattern, they've used those colours, they've used those chunky lines and that gives it a very sort of like comic book feel compared to this one, which again is a very similar image, very similar angle, um, very similar context, however a totally different approach. So they've used no line here, so there's no use of outline, all the shapes are just block colour, um, we've got different sort of use of shading, so there's very minimal shading, there's definitely no texture or pattern in this, apart from this sort of like overlay of pattern, sort of textured stock that they've put over the top, and then we've got this really funky sort of like drip lava lamp grungy style thing going on which makes it quite surreal. So you can see two very different approaches to what is technically the same image um, and really the key thing with digital illustration is just to find a style that you like. So find something that you like and go okay I think that's interesting and I like it because of this. It uses this, this and that and that's what I'm going to apply to my own. Your next step with a digital illustration is to find an image that you want to work from. Now if you're doing something like this it's most likely going to come from a photograph if you're doing something like this, it might come from a variety of photographs, so you might need to get lots of different imagery to look at to sort of inform you of what certain things look like. Um, if it's going to be more abstract, something like this, then you might do it from your own drawing. So you might sketch these things out um, and go from your own sketch. It's really up to you, depending on the context of things, how simplified you want it to be, how realistic you want it to be, how complex you want the image to be. Um, but I always start with a variety of reference imagery, either an image I'm going to work directly over the top of or images I can use to then sketch from. So one of our places we can get um, stock imagery from and reference imagery from is unsplash.com. We also have another one which is called pexels.com. Both are really good for just getting your generic stock imagery. Um, and this just means high quality secondary sources that are a bit better than Google images. So if I'm going to do, let's say, a house plant. Now we've got lots of things to think about here. Light, 
focus and composition. So by light, I mean the light, the shadow. Can you see the image clearly? Now this has got quite a lot of complicated shadows going on, which might make it quite hard. It could make it quite an interesting image if you're interested in that. But definitely for a beginner, that could be quite a hard image to do. This one, if we're thinking about focus, obviously only the centre of the image is in focus, the rest is out of focus. So again, creating things, using an image that isn't crisp and clear in focus can be very difficult, especially if you're um, not very confident. So same thing here, we've got complex shadows going on. This one, we've got that burst of light coming through, which sort of distorts the image a bit and makes it quite hard. And we've got the stems which are out of focus, so that would be very, very difficult to do. Um, again, with this one, the bits in the background are sort of shaded and shadowed out, which would make it quite hard. We've also got to think about composition. So if I look at this one here, obviously we've got bits that are out of focus. But it's also cropped off, so that would be an incredibly difficult image to then use if I then did an illustration from it and I wanted to use it on a magazine cover. I'd be very limited to how I could compose that. Um, same with this. You know, maybe this plant here, if I did an image of that, um, or that one in the middle, but we've got a lot of overlap and we've got some cropping going on. So again, it sort of limits how well we can use that image. This one's a bit better. Very simple background. The whole thing's in focus. The lighting is nice and clear. Obviously, the bottom of the basket is cut off. So it determines that your illustration would have to go at the bottom of your page. Um, so you kind of have to think about how the image is being constructed and then how that would apply to your design. If I wanted to put this at the top of my page, I'm a bit limited because I'm missing half of the object. So when I'm drawing things and I'm looking for reference imagery, I generally want to look for something that's nice and simple. So this, so the whole object is in the frame. The background's nice and simple. There's no complicated lighting. It's pretty much all in focus. So that would be a very easy thing for me to do an illustration of. Naturally, I'm drawn to this kind of thing. I love the composition of this. Um, I think it's really interesting as a photograph. But for me to try and illustrate that would be incredibly difficult because we've got issues with lighting, we've got issues with composition. It's very complex, things are cropped out. So that would be incredibly difficult. So really, what you just need to do is consider where what you want to use your illustration for. So if it's going on a magazine cover or packaging or it's going on a poster, Think about where you want to use that image and would this work? Rather than just making an illustration for the sake of it, consider the context and then if you're picking something to work from, think about how it helps you, how it informs you, whether it works in that context. Now you might just be using these as reference, you might be drawing your own, so you might use something like this to help you get an idea of something that you could then draw, so you could draw your own version of that and draw it however you want to. It's totally up to you. So one thing I do want to distinguish is um, if you're doing a digital illustration and you want to use an image to go over the top of, that is fine. So if you want to take an image and work over the top of it to create your illustration, that is absolutely fine. The key thing is that it is a photograph. If you're working from a photograph, so something that's been taken with a camera, so a real image of a real thing, and then turning it into an illustration, you are the designer, you are the illustrator, you're making those decisions for yourself and you're turning it into something else and that's the skill, that's the creative skill that's really important. However, if you take something like this, someone else has done that already. These are digital illustrations of houseplants from photographs. So another designer, another illustrator has already chosen the colour schemes, already chosen the style, already chosen the line style, already thought about what leaves they want to do and what angle they want to do it from, composition, they've made those decisions. So if you then took this into Illustrator and worked over the top of it, you're just copying them. The same as if you did it from this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, you're just copying someone else's decisions. So there's no creative skill there, you're just copying. So the key thing, whenever you look for inspiration and reference imagery, it must be a photograph, yeah? If you're looking at something like this and then taking it into Illustrator and working over the top of it, that's copying, it's plagiarism. So it's really important that you're using photography to inform your illustrations, that you're looking at real things. Yes, you can look at designers' work, so you can look at that and go, okay, I really like the way they've used this sort of simplistic style, that's the kind of thing I want to do. But if you then just copied over the top of that in Illustrator, then you're just copying it. So it's you know really important that taking inspiration from a designer and 
creating a digital illustration, there are certain steps to follow. And they're slightly different things. So, once you've picked your image, so I'm going to go to Adobe Illustrator. Obviously, we're using Illustrator because um, that's what it's for, for digital illustration, the clues in the name. Um, it's a vector program, so your illustrations can be sized up, um, bigger or smaller, and they won't go pixelated, and it gives us the creative freedom to, to make digital illustrations. Um, if you've ever used something like Procreate before, this is very different, um, or Clip Studio Paint, because they tend to be raster programs. They tend to be more like Photoshop like digital painting and things like that. So this is a digital illustration is a very different approach to digital painting. So it's really important to sort of recognize the different things. So I've got myself an A3 document here, um, mostly because I'm gonna copy and paste this a couple of times and show you a different things. Um, but I definitely would never go smaller than A3. Uh, you're always gonna want to sort of get enough detail in there and the smaller you go, the harder it is. Now you do have an artboard tool down here, so if your page is ever too small and you want to make it bigger, you can just make it bigger and then come back. So if I'm thinking, oh well, I'm not liking this, it's, I'm not getting the level of detail I want, I can then just go in and make it bigger. So you can see I've got my image here that I've chosen. I've got clear lighting, clear composition, not cropped, nice and simple. Um, I've also got my layers set out, Now I've got quite a lot on this document, so we're just going to ignore those for now. I've got myself a layer here which is technically like a group. So in Illustrator, layers have layers within them, whereas in Photoshop, layers are just on their own. So think of these layers as groups, essentially, um, or pages, in a sense. Now, what I've done is I've got my image on a layer. I've called this line, because I'm going to show you some line techniques. Um, so you can just double click it to rename it. And then I've got my image here, and I've just used this little box, which lets you lock that image. If I didn't lock that image, it would move around and drive me mad. I've also turned the opacity of that layer down a little bit so that I can see what I'm doing a bit more clearly. Now I've got my first sort of simplistic line drawing here. Now this was just done using the pen tool, so if you've used Illustrator before or a similar vector program to make um, logos or icons, pen tool should be fairly familiar to you. You could use something called the pencil tool, which I'm going to get onto next. Um, if you've got something like a Wacom tablet or a drawing tablet, it might feel more um, sort of familiar to use things like the pencil tool and the paintbrush. But for now, I'm just going to use the pen tool because it's just as good. Now I want to show you how I got to that stage. So I'm going to take this leaf. Now I'm going to get zoomed in. It's always important just to, to see where you're going. And I'm clicking and dragging. And I'm just going around. Now I've picked a plant for a bit of creative license. If I was doing something like a face, um, faces kind of sort of have to look perfect. And that's sort of the, the curse of portraiture. You know if the eyes are a little bit wonky, you know if the lips are the right, aren't the right size or it's not in proportion. They're very tricky to do. Whereas with something like a plant, um, it's mother nature. So it can look, you know, if the leaf is slightly wonky or slightly out of proportion, no one's going to know because there's no right or wrong with what a leaf should look like. There's no sort of... Um, there's no right or wrong, so nice and easy. So I've got my first leaf shape, which you can see is the same as that one. Now, when you look at sort of this up here, we've got lots of overlap, so it's really up to you how you approach overlapping shapes. I like to break things down and keep it nice and simple, so I'm gonna start in this corner again. Now I've got two choices here. I could make it up, so I could look at what I can see, and then guesstimate the bits that I can't see and make it up. So you can see as I get to behind this leaf, I could go, oh, well, I think that probably goes to around there, and I could carry on like that. But I am guesstimating. And then the same here. Or if we look at my earlier one, you can see I've done this sort of almost like avoidance method. So wherever I can't see something, I've just avoided it and gone round, so I could go round. So I'm going to do a mix of both so I'm just going to sort of avoid that and I'm just going to go around the bit that's on top and join it back up. Now as we're doing line drawings here you might want to leave these just as outlines. If we were moving on to do something that was filled in we could put a white fill in there and then as long as your top leaf or the, the layer, the image, the part of the thing that's on top is on top then it wouldn't really matter about this overlapping stuff but because we're doing line that might not work. 
So for example, if I wanted to do something that was a little bit abstract, if we go back to our Pinterest board, say I wanted to do something like this. So I've got a really nice line drawing and then I've got these funky shapes behind it. If I wanted to do something like that, obviously my, my leaf here isn't filled in with white, it's see-through. So I want to leave the white fill off and then I put like a funky shape in the background. Now obviously that's not going to work because we've got all of this overlap going on. So you could go to that avoidance method or you could use something called the eraser tool. Now the eraser tool isn't really like Photoshop. This is a shape, so it will stay a shape. And you can see it stays a closed shape. So all it does is it moves those lines and keeps it a closed shape. So it's up to you whether that works for you or not. So we've sort of gone back to what we had here. Or if you want to actually take it from you know the closed shape it is currently to something different, then what I could do is use the scissor tool instead. So the scissors, you go to sort of the point where you want it to break, where you want to break the line. So I'm going to click there, and I click there, there, and there, and there, and there. And then you should be able to see, actually, these corners aren't connected anymore. So that's not connected anymore. That's not connected anymore. And that's not connected anymore. And then I could move this shape back up. So you can see we then get a little bit more sort of abstractiness going on. So it's totally up to you how you want to do that or how you want to approach that. But that is the sort of basic of pen tool, overlapping shapes, and then the scissor tool and the eraser tool. Now, obviously we've got stems on here. You can see with my stems, I've sort of done the, the pen tool again, and I've done them a chunk at a time. So if I go to where it's sort of really complicated down here, all I've done is gone, okay, well I've got this stem here, Oh, we've got a really heavy thickness on there. And I've sort of done that, which is okay. It's really up to you how you want this. I would take the thickness of that down. Now, obviously, you can see I'm not even at one point stroke. I'm doing sort of like 0 0.5. So this is where having a bigger artboard and bigger designs makes this a lot more useful. So you can go chunkier with your outlines and get better variety of line width. When you're working as small as I am here, it starts to get a little bit complicated and a little bit limited. So that's my option one for the stem. This is where the pencil tool might come in. So if I look at the stem again, so if I go for this one, I can obviously just do one line like that. And then I can change the thickness of it. So I could do that. Um, or the pencil tool also sort of does what the pen tool does. So it draws a shape. Now, you'll see there, I don't know if you noticed that, it sort of adjusts. So I draw that, and then it sort of guesstimates. It doesn't draw exactly what you ask it to. Now, that's because I've got this setting on smooth. So I've double-clicked the pencil tool there to open my options. If I take it towards the accurate side, and I do this, you'll see that little lumpy bit that I've put in there that I sort of did by mistake, because I'm using a mouse, so it's not perfect, um, has stayed. If I delete that and go back to my smoother setting, I do that again. So again, not perfect. You can see it sort of smooths it out for me a little bit. So it sort of guesstimates where it thinks I want things. Um, so again, pencil tool might work for you, or you might go for the pen tool for thinner lines. It's totally up to you. I've also not got any detail on these leaves at the moment. So I could go in my pencil tool and I could add lines in for these detail bits and obviously make them much thinner. Now the important thing to remember is about various line widths. So obviously at the moment that's about 0.7. You always want your outside of something to be thicker than your detail. So if I've got the outside of a shape I want the line width to be thicker than the detail part. So if you think back to when you've done fine liner drawings you always go around the outside with a thicker pen. So it's the same sort of thing. You want your lines to be thicker than the lines you use for shading or detail. I could also do um, something a bit more abstract. So I could go and sort of take a, a shape to add detail and do something like that. And again, make my outlines thicker. give it that sort of effect. Maybe like that. Totally up to you what you want to go with and we're going to come back to those in a minute. 
So here I've got my sort of finished outline. Now obviously that's not finished finished. I'm not happy with that as a finished line illustration. Lots of other things I can try. So one thing I do want to highlight is that my layers have already got quite complicated. So already just by doing that and those there, this is my layers panel. So it's looking quite busy already. If I open my group here, which is actually this, so this object here, you can see the amount of layers that we've built up. So it's really important that you have things grouped. So it's just nice and simple. Drag over the object, you can go to object group, or you can go to properties, and there's a button for group there, or you can do command G on your keyboard and it groups it together. And that just cleans things up for you. So I'd do the same to these, just select those, command G. And then you can see we've got two groups and our original image, which makes things a lot more simpler. And then when we're navigating our layers and we're trying to find stuff, it's so much easier. Now I'm actually going to copy and paste this group, this uh, image here. Now I've talked about various line widths. Obviously I've not got any detail on this at the moment, so it's not going to make a massive lot of difference. The other thing we can do is play around with something called the profile of the line. Um, and this is really important for giving it a bit more of a professional feel. This is what really adds to your design and starts to take it to the next level. So if I go to my profile and I go here, I've got a couple of options and you'll see, if I zoom in, it's slightly different to my other one. Now I'll show you a couple of different ones so you can sort of see we're getting different thicknesses across the line. So the line is not one uniform thickness all the way through. Whereas originally we had same thickness all the way. Now if you're thinking about if you use like a pen or a pencil or a piece of chalk, whatever, you don't tend to get the same thickness or a paintbrush all the way through. It's not natural. It's only really computers that have that sort of accuracy. So to give it, you know, more interest, more dynamism, some, you know, more sort of personality to the piece, I really like these kind of effects. Um, and if I show you what that actually looks like in real life, I just do a straight line and I'll do a sort of wavy shape. So if I add a stroke profile to those, you can see what it does. I'm just going to actually make them a bit chunkier. Now, the profile's more exaggerated. You can see the chunkier the line is, the more exaggerated that is. So this basically mimics that shape. And then what it does is I started here, that was my first point. So my first point is there, my last point is there. So my first point is there, I went all the way around and my last point is there. So you can see how it applies. So if I show you a different one, you can see how it applies to the shape. And another one, and another one, and so on and so forth. We've also got, these little buttons here so you can swap how it applies and switch it around. They're very subtle effects definitely um, but they can, that can be quite interesting and can be quite effective and you can play around with where you want that effect to apply on the line and then once you've got sort of a whole image you can really just play around with which shapes and which objects and which lines go in that direction. So now what I'm going to do is go back here and show you where that really makes a difference. So you can see I've got my lines that I've created in this group. So like this one here, if I select that one, that one, that one, and that one, they're very boring at the moment. Um, if I go back to my stroke and my stroke profiles and add something like that, then they start to get more interesting. If I switch it round so it's thicker at the beginning and thinner at the end and then make them thicker, we start to get something that is a lot more exciting than what we had before. And then if I go to my chunkier outline here and I do the same thing and I maybe try something different, so let's go with maybe that. You can see we're starting to get something that looks a lot more interesting than what we had originally which was just boring flat lines. So you can see how that makes a big difference. The other thing you want to think about, if you're doing something that is very clean and crisp and is very geometric, if we look at the quality of this line, it's very sort of unhappy at the moment. And if I just draw a basic 
corner for you, we've got a couple of things. We've got corners and we've got caps. So caps are the end of your line, corners are obviously the corner, and then you've got another cap at the end. If I select this and I go to my stroke, we've got options for caps and we've got options for corners. Now currently they're both on these sort of first settings. If I change my caps to a round cap, you can immediately see that it curves off the edges. And then if I change my corner to a curved corner, you can see it curves off that corner. I always, always use curved caps and curved corners. It makes such a massive difference compared to horrible and straight, lovely and curved. And it just gives it that extra level of quality and sophistication. It really makes a big difference. So things like caps and corners and then things like using those stroke width profiles can make a massive difference to your designs. The next thing we can also do, so if I copy and paste this again, so it's not just the thickness of the line, it's not just the profile that we've added it to it, we can also, if I put that back to our basic one, we've also got something called brushes. So because we use the pen tool and we're doing a line drawing, brushes only apply to a line, so they only apply to an outline. So all of our design is outlines at the moment. So if I go to my brushes panel, or if you go to window and brushes to open the panel, you'll see I've got some different options in here. Now these are because these are ones I've used recently. Yours might not look like this. You've also got a button that says library. So if we go to the library, I always use the artistic ones. And my favourite are chalk, charcoal, pencil. You can look through them all, but I genuinely always come back to these. So if I open that up, it gives us this menu. And it gives us all these different options for brushes. Now we're working quite small. So these are going to be quite big. So I'm actually just going to make my image bigger so you can see these better. Um, brushes are quite chunky, so they tend to work better on a bigger image. So if I go for that one, you'll see it then applies that textured brush to that outline. If I go for something thinner, it's more subtle. If I go for something thicker, it's a lot more exaggerated. And again, I can change the thickness of that and bring it down. Um, I think it'd have to be on the smallest setting really to be worthwhile using. Um, and then again, it depends. You can see that these are all different thicknesses. So it's really about playing around. And what we're adding here is texture. So that's what's going on is we're looking at the texture of the line, creating a textured effect, adding some interest. It's all about interest, character, personality, adding that bit of flair to your work. So we've looked at stroke profiles, but brushes is another option. Now, brushes obviously work with whatever color you choose. So if you change the color of your line, it changes the color of the brush, like so. Um, and obviously at the moment we just worked in black and white, so we could work in a coloured, we could work with coloured on a, a background, so we could go for contrasting colours, so I've got blue there, so I'm going to go for sort of a yellow tone on the outline, and I'm going to bring that to the bottom of this. arrange onto the back and then it goes to the bottom of my layer. So you can see I've got my coloured on my coloured background. Um, really there's tons of things to play around with but your basics are your stroke width, so varying widths, so different thicknesses for the inside and the outside line, then your different profiles, so playing around with the thickness of the line throughout the piece and seeing what that does. So that's in stroke and then it's down here and seeing what you like, maybe doing different things for different parts of it. We've also then got your brushes panel. You can look through all of the brushes, um, but the rest tend to be unusable, really. Um, so you really only want your artistic. Now, if you look at something like, uh, let's say, watercolour, you'll see that watercolour are quite see-through. So if I apply a watercolour brush to this now, you'll see that it goes very strange. Um, and it really depends on whether that's the kind of thing you want or not. Um, totally up to you it can work and you can sort of change the color of these but it is very subtle so I tend to find those chalk charcoal pencil ones are the best in in my opinion for for working but it's totally up to you and totally up to you how you try them how you use them you know in in what style in what way you want to go with them and I would advise obviously I've got that on 0.25 which is the smallest I can go I would advise making your image bigger 
if you're going to use um, brushes. So I'm only using about, that's probably about A5 size at the moment. I'd go full A, A3 if you can, and then you're going to get the sort of style that you want. We've also talked about detail. So obviously you can add detail with the pencil tool. So the pencil tool can be used to do lines or it can be used to make full shapes. Totally up to you. Um, the last thing you might want to try is the paintbrush. So again, this is good for detail. Um, so if I go to my line art here and I go to the paintbrush. Now with the, pen, the paintbrush and the eraser tool, if you double click them and it's similar to the pencil when we were looking at that smooth setting, um, with your eraser, if you double click it, you can make it bigger and smaller. Same with the paintbrush, if you double click it, you can change it to smooth to accurate. So you get to open up those extra settings. And then the same thing again with the paintbrush, you can use your brushes. So if I go to one of my brushes here and I'm going to do it, it's going to do it in yellow and it's going to do it one point, then I can add my detail on with that brush. This is really good for doing things like adding extra texture. Obviously it does do it in a line, so that's the important thing is you're using a paintbrush, so you're doing a line. If you start to do lots of shading, it doesn't look so great. Um, so it's really good for detail, for line. You could do things like cross hatching. Um, so if I do a little bit of cross hatching on here, like that. Now obviously it's not perfect. Um, again, you know, you're using your mouse, so you're limited to that. I could then take those shapes and then apply a brush stroke to them to try and get that added texture in there. Um, I could obviously look at my width, my stroke profile, so I could play around with that um, and see what that does and see how that goes. So you can do that kind of thing. If you think back to when we did fine liner work, you could also do linear. Um, so I'm actually going to do that with the pen tool. So if you remember, linear is that more sort of um, sleek, controlled, using a line and then it becomes broken as you go down. A really good way to do that, and there's loads of really good YouTube tutorials that show you how to do sort of vintage, retro style linear shading, is get your line. I'm going to make it a little bit thicker. And then I remember I want my caps and my corners, so I want my caps and my corners on curved. You can see that curves those edges for us. And then I'm actually just going to go in, and if you remember the scissor tool, I'm going to go, I'm going to break the line there and there. Just make sure I actually click on the little line. And then I'm going to go back in, and then you should see that it's broken it down for me, so I've taken chunks out. So then I could do the same on this one. I could go there, there. delete those extra sections out that I don't need. You can see we sort of get that linear shading effect. So lots of different ways to do shading, lots of different ways to do detail. It's totally up to you how you approach this. And then obviously play around with color, play around with thickness, play around with colored backgrounds instead of um, just black and white, you know, play around with gradients in the background and really just experiment and explore. So that is the basics of line illustration in Illustrator.